Um, essentially, Beckett presents us with a postmodern world, a world devoid of objective meaning and values, a world inhabited by billions of fragmented and decentered selves, a world where the self and the other are wholly interdependent upon one another. And um, so Beckett's images, of course, do point to philosophy. The theater of the absurd is concerned with human existence, the human situation in an otherwise bleak and uh, meaningless universe. Philosophy itself is, uh, like I said, anthropocentric. It's entirely human-centered. It's all about human existence, really, when you get down to it. Uh, philosophy furnishes the absurd with its ideological underpinnings. Philosophy brought humanity <coughs> basically to the end of everything, which is where we find Beckett's play. Uh, the end of truth with the capital T, the death of God, the loss of stable centers, and the recognition of the basic inadequacy of language. Thus, the basic tenets of the absurd are quite simply the logical conclusions of more than 2,000 years of philosophizing. Um, and a brief summary of philosophy's influence on the absurd. So, um, concerning truth, you have Socrates, who was preoccupied with essences and definitions. In dialectics, uh, with others, he often defeated his opponents by uh, asking them to define their terms. However, if equally pressed, I'm sure that Socrates himself would have actually failed to define the terms of his own arguments as well. Um, and this, of course, is an early sign of decay in language um, and its ability to communicate meaning. And then you have Nietzsche's proclamation that God is dead. Uh, the realization of the absurdity of human existence basically ushers in what you see in Beckett's play, an era of pessimism and nihilism. Uh, Nietzsche extols this death while countless others lamented. And um, with Nietzsche, Sartre, and, and Derrida alike, you see a celebration of this loss of centers in a way, um, even though Sartre does say it would be better if God the Father himself did exist, but we'll leave that aside. Um, basically, God, truth, humanity, and so on, uh, all these centers are lost, and, um, and these philosophers rejoice in this freedom that they see. Um, Basically, without centers, life in existence itself becomes the artist's blank canvas, in a sense. And so for Derrida, in, in Difference, he says, uh, the lack of a transcendental signified, that is, a center that would disrupt the free play of meaning, uh, must be affirmed. He says, we must affirm it in the sense that Nietzsche brings affirmation into play uh, with a certain laughter and a certain dance, essentially overcoming the seriousness, not searching for the capital T truth, but being happy just in the search itself, right? So other articles that I discuss um, that are basically supplementary and they legitimize my argument, so to speak, are Robert E. Lauder's Accept the Absurd, Beckett and Kierkegaard, Godot and Christ, though I do try to stay away from the relig religious readings of this play. Um, secondly, John Fletcher's Samuel Beckett and the Philosophers, I look at what philosophers he's using, and, and I'm coming at it at a very different angle. And then, um, I forget this, I don't know how to pronounce this, this man's name, uh, Pierre Nicrod, uh, in the ruins of the past, reading Beckett intertextually. I also take a look at that and discuss that building up to my analysis of Beckett. And um, so how the poetic images of Beckett uh, play, uh, Beckett's play point to philosophy. I do not aim to give any definitive or final interpretation of this work, nor do I aim to locate any philosophical lesson or message that the text may or may not contain. Uh, instead, I aim to show how a reader or audience member with a philosophical background may be better equipped to decode the seemingly incomprehensible nature of these characters. Reading Didi and Gogo as the physical embodiment of many philosophical binaries, basically. Ultimately, Didi can be read as the privileged uh, position of many Western philosophical binary distinctions. Uh, DD basically is rational, is the mind, the self, and the master. Whereas Gogo represents the inferior or unprivileged positions of, the, of uh, these binaries, the empirical, the body, the other, and the slave. And um, so with my body, I'll look to Rene Descartes. With the self-other distinction, I'll look to Heidegger and Sartre's philosophy. And then with the master-slave dialectic, I went to Hegel. And so with Cartesian or mind-body dualism uh, in Didi and Gogo, uh, the one quote that I basically center everything on with Descartes is, 
and therefore precisely nothing but a thinking thing that is a mind or intellect or understanding or reason. And uh, I have two columns here. I have Didi on the left, I have Gogo on the right. Didi as mind or the rational. Um, Didi is often described as musing, meditating, and thinking. Uh, he repeatedly removes his hat, peers inside it, feels about inside it, shakes it, puts it on again. He has stinking breath. He seems to remember more of the, uh, of the past than Gogo. Uh, he would rather see Lucky think aloud. Uh, he is also uh, the one who insists that the tramps keep their appointment with Gato. So in a sense, he is more cerebral than uh, his counterpart, Gogo. Gogo, I read as body or empirical. Um, he's obsessed with his feet and boots. Uh, he spends the first few pages or minutes of Act 1 trying to get his boot off. He pulls at it with both hands, panting. He gives up exhausted rest, tries again. He has stinking feet. Um, at times, uh, we, we find out that he doesn't listen. He doesn't listen to the agreement that they make uh, with Gatto. He uh, cannot remember meeting Pazzo and Lucky in Act 2. Uh, well, he cannot remember meeting them in Act 1 uh, when he gets to Act 2. And uh, he would rather see Lucky dance. So he's much more physical, much more, uh, he s seems to embody the body more than Dee Dee does. And with the self-other distinction, um, you have Heidegger's being and, and uh, time. And in it, he talks about human existence. Uh, he uses the term Dasein rather than human, and this is all really condensed. Uh, why, why Dasein? Um, to avoid the, the connotative baggage, so to speak, um, the, pre, the preconceptions that inevitably come with a loaded term like human. Um, okay. And uh, the world of Dasein is a with world. In fact, according to Heidegger, the very existence of others brings one to an awareness of one's own existence as a self-present being, uh, with a capital B, a conscious being, um, and also a little b being, an object in the world, so to speak. Uh, in discussing uh, the Dasein, or the self's encounter with others, Heidegger rhetorically asks, uh, does one not start by marking out and isolating the I? So the very presence of the other uh, brings the self to the awareness of the self as subject, right? basically. Um, brings self-presence to the, the subject. And then, um, so existence as such is a twofold contingent fact for Heidegger. Uh, as I said, the, the recognition of the self as subject comes to life basically in the existence of the other, in the recognition of the other. Um, and this is how the self and the other are separated. Uh, and in Sartre's being and nothingness, Sartre further develops uh, the self-other relation in a way somewhat similar to Heidegger. Sartre writes, by the mere appearance of the other, I am put in the position of passing judgment on myself as an object, for it is as an object that I appear to the other. The other exists in this sense as a kind of talking mirror. The other is a threat to the self, because the other can pass judgment on the self, can uh, provide an arbitrary label, essence, or identity on the self. And um, in this way, the other uh, basically is a threat because the other limits the self and limits the self's freedom. And Eslin indirectly points uh, out that Sartre and Beckett share the same obsession. Um, Beckett's preoccupation is with the problem of being um, problem of being uh, and the identity of the self. So according to Sartre, the self is and the other confront one another in pure violence. Uh, there is always a contest between who does the looking and who is looked at, um, who is subject and who is object. There's always that competition. So Sartre in a Cartesian, uh, is not a Cartesian dualist, but he's a subject-object dualist. Subject self, object other, self as object to the other, etc. I mean, it gets confusing in that sense. But, um, so every self is at one and the same time a subject for itself and an object in itself, in a sense. Um, but you can't, but the reconciling the two is the difficulty. Um,